Welcome back to this video series about private equity net returns, where we talk about how most private equity GPs model fund expenses, management fees, and carried interest in their marketing and fundraising materials. My name's Mike Reinert. I've worked in the industry for 15 years. I run the Auxilia Mathematical website, and I wrote the book Private Equity Value Creation Analysis. These videos cover findings from my work website and book, and they're designed for private equity practitioners who use data to raise capital or evaluate the returns of private equity deals, funds, GPs, and investment programs. If it's helpful to you, subscribe and check out the website where you can download the Excel files behind every episode. This is the second video in the Private Equity Net Returns series, where I describe the traditional net return model for a group of private equity deals that don't have real net returns because they're not real private equity funds. We'll start with a portfolio like this one here. It has four exited investments and four active investments. Overall, it has a gross multiple of 1.7x and a gross IRR of 20%. Now, if it were a real fund, we could just look at the cash flows between it and the limited partners and plug the resulting net multiple and net IRR right here down at the bottom of the chart. But let's assume we don't have that. Maybe this is a track record for a fundless sponsor or a group of GP investments that were made across multiple funds that have different fee and carry characteristics. To estimate a net IRR in the conventional manner, we start with a set of gross cash flows that look like this. At the bottom, we can calculate the gross multiple and gross IRR for every deal. And on the right-hand side, we add up all the deal columns to get a set of portfolio cash flows. This gives us the portfolio gross multiple and the portfolio gross IRR. Now, in the conventional hypothetical net return model, we need to make several estimates and assumptions. The portfolio has 180 million of gross invested capital, so we'll need a fund size that is bigger than that. Let's go with 200 million of committed capital. Annual management fees are based on committed capital or fund size. So let's say 2% per year in each of the first four years, and then we'll reduce it to 1% in years five and six. That adds up to 10% of the fund size or 20 million. Fund expenses can depend on many different factors. Here, let's just say they're 5 million. So total fees and expenses are 25 million. To calculate carried interest, we look at profit after fees and expenses. That would be the total gross return of 310 minus 180 of invested capital and 25 in fees and expenses or 105 million. Carried interest would be 20% of this number, or 21 million. Now, from this, we can already calculate a net multiple of invested capital. It is gross return minus a carry divided by gross invested capital plus the fees and expenses. So 289 over 205 gives us a net multiple of 1.410x. To calculate a net IRR, we must make some decisions about timing. We can make our management fee deductions at the beginning of the year as follows. And we'll take all of our fund expense deductions at the same time. Here, we front load them a bit because that's what usually happens with a real fund. And then for the 21 million of carried interest, let's take half of it when several big exits occur in June of 2021 and then deduct the rest from the 2022 year-end fair market value. Add everything up and we get the expected net multiple of 1.41x and the net IRR of 12.3%. Great, now the analyst can go back to the performance slide and add these numbers to the table. They'll also need to add a footnote or endnote somewhere in the deck to explain their methodology. This is how I would write it for the model that we just built. What makes it so long is that, to provide enough detail for a third party to recreate our math, we must explain the size of every deduction and exactly when the deduction occurs. Anyway, the model wasn't too difficult to build at this point, so let's flip this over to the compliance department and then check out for the weekend. Or so we think, because that's when the boss comes in and says, Peter, what's happening? Great job on that hypothetical net return model. But I just got off the phone with Fund Legal Counsel, and they said that since we show gross returns for the active and exited investments in the table, we should also show net returns to make sure we're compliant with these new SEC marketing rules. So I'm going to need you to go ahead and come in on Saturday and update those models for us. Okay, this really shouldn't be too bad. We just need to split the portfolio into an exited cohort and an active cohort and then run through all the fee, expense, and carry adjustments like we did last time. Here is our starting point. First, we'll remove the active deal so we can calculate the exited net multiple and exited net IRR. The four deals have 90 million of gross invested capital, so let's make it a $100 million fund. The math for the management fees is the same, it just turns out to be half the amount because the fund is half the size. And we can go ahead and cut the fund expenses in half as well. This gives us 12.5 million of fees and expenses. Now, the fees and expenses may be half of the portfolio's total, but the carry is not. When we run the numbers, we see that carry is 13.5 million because the exited deals have outperformed the active deals to date. When we run these numbers through the net multiple of invested capital formula, we get a net multiple of 1.53x. 
Okay, to calculate the net IRR, we must add a date to every deduction. We'll use the same timing for both the management fees and expenses. One thing we noticed, though, is that we're charging a fee in December 2021, which is six months after the portfolio is fully realized. That usually wouldn't happen in a real fund, but we'll just leave it as is for now because it's probably not worth making any kind of manual adjustment for it. For carry, we'll deduct the 13.5 at the June 2021 exits. This gives us the following hypothetical net cash flows with a 1.53x net multiple and an 18.3% net IRR. Great, but let us not forget the footnote we'll need to explain our methodology. Here's an example of how I might write it. Okay, now back to the total portfolio so we can do the same for the active deals. First, we remove the four exits as follows. The remaining four active deals have 90 million of gross invested capital. So again, let's call it a $100 million fund. That means we can make the fees and expenses exactly the same as in the exited portfolio as follows. But carried interest will be different here. Because the active deals have underperformed the exited ones to date, carry is only 7.5 million. When we run these through the net multiple of invested capital formula, we get a net multiple of 1.29x. Okay, to calculate a net IRR, we must add a date to every deduction. We'll use the same time for both management fees and expenses as last time. Now, one thing that kind of jumps out at us here is we see the first portfolio investment doesn't take place until 2017, but we're calling 3 million of fees and expenses a full year ahead of that in 2016. This is something that will materially impact an IRR. So we usually want to move some of these dates around to address that and make this look more like the cash flow dynamics of a real fund. But for today, we'll just keep it as is. Okay, on carried interest, we'll just deduct it all from the fair market value. And this gives us the following hypothetical net cash flows with a 1.29x net multiple and a 7.3% net IRR. Almost done. Let's not forget about that big, ugly footnote. We'll need to explain it. Here's an example of how it might be written. Great. Back to our performance table in the presentation. We can add the exited and active net returns as follows. And if we shrink the font size down to eight points, which I think might be the legal minimum from an SEC perspective, we can get all the explanatory footnotes right here under the table. All right. Not the best way to spend a Saturday, but at least we're done. And Peter, what's happening? Yeah, I just got off the phone with our compliance consultants, and they said given these new SEC marketing rules, we might need to show a net multiple and net IRR for each of the deals on the table. So I'm going to need you to go ahead, come in on Sunday, and build a new one for each one of our portfolio companies. So that's about as far as we'll get with this conventional net return model. If you adhere to the strictest interpretation of these new SEC marketing rules, for this tiny little eight deal fund, we would have 11 different Excel models, 11 sets of assumptions, and 11 separate footnotes. Everything needs to be updated and redone whenever valuations change, usually quarterly, and also whenever new investments are made or existing companies are sold. So that's probably five or six times per year on average. You also have the problem that each model is based on relatively arbitrary decisions about theoretical fund sizes, management fees, fund expenses, and carried interest. So it's a lot of work with a lot of potential for mistakes and a lot of potential for manipulation. Well, the good news is that it doesn't have to be this way. Our friend, the analyst Chad, bought an obscure book on Amazon, and he spent some time on the private equity math website, Auxilia Mathematica. He learned how to calculate all the net multiples and net IRRs that its compliance department needs using a single Excel model and a single set of assumptions. We'll see that the key to doing this is making all the fee, expense, and carry deductions systematically. Instead of picking arbitrary amounts and dates for each adjustment, Chad asks, what if we made every negative cash flow a little bit more negative to account for fees and expenses? And what if we made every positive cash flow a little less positive to account for carried interest? This gives us a single set of net cash flows that can provide 11 net multiples and 11 net IRRs on a single spreadsheet. We'll show you exactly how to build that in the next video. Don't forget to check the link in the description for the episode page where you can review notes and references and download Excel templates for the models that we discussed in this video. If you need more help on getting your net return models up to speed, feel free to get in touch. Thanks for watching and see you next time.